Welcome to this episode of Real Chemistry. I'm Dr. Morris. Today we're going to be talking about Gibbs free energy and spontaneity. By the end of this video, you should be able to look at a chemical reaction and decide if it's spontaneous or not, and at what temperatures. Before we get to Gibbs free energy, let's just talk about spontaneity. Spontaneity is a process that just happens. So a spontaneous process just happens, like this skier going downhill. That's a spontaneous process. If you're at the top of the hill, you'll naturally go down it. On the other hand, when you get to the bottom of the hill and you want to get back up to the top, that's a non-spontaneous process. It takes work. It takes intervention. And in fact, at a ski resort, they're usually going to have a ski lift to take you back up to the top. Right? So a spontaneous process just occurs. A non-spontaneous process requires work or some other uh, interaction to get it to happen. Now, in this case, what's driving the skier downhill? Primarily a change in energy, right? The top of the hill is high in potential energy, the bottom of the hill is low, and, and you naturally go down it. But some processes are actually determined by entropy. So, for example, here, right, we already said the top picture, its spontaneity is determined by energy. And on the next page, we're going to start to call that delta H. We're going to think about energy as being enthalpy, delta H. In this bottom picture, we have a bunch of gas molecules all on the left side. And we know that naturally they're going to drift to the right side and they're going to become evenly distributed like that. So this direction is spontaneous and the backwards direction is non-spontaneous. That turns out to be because of entropy. So this process is spontaneous because of entropy. So both energy and entropy play a role in determining if a process is spontaneous. For entropy, it's basically just the case that the picture on the right here is more disordered. There's more possible arrangement of those gas molecules where they drift between both halves of our vessel there. So entropy can drive a process to be spontaneous or energy can. And what Gibbs free energy does is it combines thinking about energy and entropy into one term called Gibbs free energy. Let's look at that. So Gibbs free energy is this delta G guy. That's our Gibbs free energy. Delta H is our enthalpy, which is like our energy. And delta S is our entropy. When our Gibbs free energy is less than zero, that's a spontaneous process. So if you get a negative Gibbs free energy, that's spontaneous. On the other hand, if your Gibbs free energy is greater than zero, or positive, right? That guy's positive, that guy's negative, then you get a non-spontaneous process. Lastly, if you had a Gibbs free energy of exactly zero, that just means you're at equilibrium. Neither the forward or the backward process is spontaneous. Alright, so if you're given the enthalpy and entropy of a reaction then you can actually figure out what the Gibbs free energy is. And sometimes it's useful just to know if the sign change of enthalpy and entropy are positive and negative, what is that going to do to your Gibbs free energy? And that's what we're going to fill out on this slide. We have a table here that tells us about enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy. And we're going to fill this out one row at a time. So first, let's consider the case where enthalpy is positive, or negative, sorry, entropy is positive. What goes on there? Well, that's basically saying this term is negative, and this term right here is positive. So what does that do to our Gibbs free energy? Well, if I have a negative number and then I subtract a positive number from it, I'm always going to get a negative number, right? So if I have negative 10 and I subtract 5 from it, I'm going to get negative 15. If I have negative 100 and I subtract 20 from it, I'm going to get negative 120. So a negative term minus a positive term always gives me a negative Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy in this case is always negative. And remember that a negative Gibbs free energy makes the reaction spontaneous. All right, let's look at another case where we have a positive delta H, a negative delta S. Let's look at what that does. Well, in this case, our enthalpy is positive, and we're subtracting a negative number. Let's think about what happens there. I have plus 10, and I subtract negative 5. That gives me 15, positive 15. I have a positive 20, and I subtract negative 10. That gives me a positive 30. So always in this case, I'm going to get a positive delta G. And that means the process is always non-spontaneous. Those are the two sort of straightforward cases. Now we'll look at one that uh, is a little bit more complicated, where we have a positive delta H and a positive delta S. Well, that term's positive, and then I'm subtracting a positive number. Is that going to give me a negative or positive number? Well, in this case, it depends, right? If I have positive 10 and I subtract 3, I'm going to get 7, a positive number. On the other hand, if I have positive 10 and I subtract 100, I'm going to get negative 90. I'm going to get a negative number. So it depends on how big this term is, right? And remember, that term involves this T, which is temperature. So what that means, basically, is if my temperature is really small, 
then the thing I'm subtracting is really small. So that's like saying I have positive 10 and I'm just subtracting like one from it. So at a small temperature, this is gonna be positive. On the other hand, if I make my temperature really, really, really big, imagine my temperature is 10,000 degrees, right? Well, then I'm subtracting some term times 10,000, and that's usually going to be negative because it's a big number then. So what that means is my delta G is going to be negative here only at large T's. Now, that just means I'm not going to specify the exact T, and it doesn't mean like, oh, 300 is large and 500 is large, but 200 is not. It just means if you make T big enough, if you make T big enough, it's going to get negative. Because if I make this T big enough, that's gonna make this whole negative term big enough and eventually it'll get negative, right? So at high enough t's, that's gonna be a negative process. And so that means this is gonna be spontaneous, but only at high temperatures. All right, let's look at our last case. Here we have a negative delta H and a negative delta S. What's gonna happen there? Well, now I have a negative number and I'm subtracting a negative number. So if I have negative 10 and I subtract a negative three, that'll give me negative 7, right? If I have negative 10 and I subtract a negative 50, that'll give me positive 40. So again, it depends on how big this t is. In this case, though, the negative times the negative here makes a positive, right? And that means that it's at big t's that it's no longer a negative number. So this one will be negative, but only at small t's, right? For example, imagine t is 0. If t is zero, then this whole term is zero. And of course, I'm gonna have a negative delta G because I have a negative delta H. So in this case, my reaction will be spontaneous, but only at low t's. Again, that just means if you make your temperature low enough, eventually that process will be spontaneous. It's not telling you where that change happens. It depends on the particular reaction. So these are all the different possible options. And that means if I just know the sign change for enthalpy and entropy, I can determine if it's a spontaneous process or not, and at what temperature range that will be the case. So this table may be good to memorize or to understand. If you can walk through that math on your own and understand that, then you don't need to memorize it. But if that was a little tricky, then I recommend at least starting with memorizing it so you can look at a chemical reaction and decide, is this going to be spontaneous or not? Let's go ahead and do that now. So here, we have two reactions. And let's go ahead and write down and remember that I know delta G is equal to delta H plus, oops, I'm sorry, minus T delta S. Now, in this case, I have a negative delta H, negative, and a positive change in entropy. So what does that mean? That means I have a negative term, and I'm subtracting a negative term from it. So a negative number minus a number always be negative, right? Negative 10 minus 100 gives you negative 110. It's always negative. So this guy is going to always have a negative delta G. And that means it's spontaneous, because negative Gs are spontaneous, at all temperatures. Doesn't matter what the T is, we're gonna have a negative delta H. I'm sorry, negative delta G. All right, now let's look at this water process. Here, water is going from solid to liquid. What is that? That's an ice cube melting. And once again, we know delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. In this case, our entropy change is positive. This number is positive, so our entropy change is positive, and our enthalpy change is positive. All right, what does that mean? Well, that means the only way that we're gonna get a negative delta G is if this T is big, right? At big T's, I'm going to be subtracting a big number. And so my positive delta H, as soon as T times delta S gets bigger than that, I'm going to end up with a negative G. So that's going to be spontaneous, but only at high T's. And that's, in fact, exactly what you'd expect, right? We know ice cubes melt spontaneously at high temperatures. They don't melt at minus 30 degrees Celsius, but if you get them to 100 degrees Celsius, they definitely melt. So that's exactly what we expect. This process becomes spontaneous, but only at a high enough temperature. Okay, thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry on Gibbs Free Energy and Spontaneity. If you have any questions, I'll leave them below. Thanks for watching.